Welcome. At this point in the semester, we've talked about some choices that you're making and we've applied some ethical theories and some criteria to that. The question we have is, how does this work with other people? If we're moving from a system where we're going to look at consequences to maybe some larger rules, are these consistent across the board or when we're interacting with each other, does that actually change it? Are human beings not so easy to put in boxes? And I care a little bit more about what's happening in my life than maybe what's happening in yours. And is that okay? And how does that work? And how should we move and relate with that? So we're gonna apply this in what's usually referred to as lifeboat ethics. It's an overall category of ethics of relationships because, well, it almost seems like it's its own category that doesn't fit into just consequentialism, nor virtue ethics, nor deontology. We should look at how we got here. This wasn't by accident. Of course, it's easy for me to say that having designed the course, I've got an idea of where we're trying to go in mind with all of this. When we finally got to this ethics and application period of the course, not only do we have realistic fictitious characters we can kind of lean in on and you're interviewing people and getting engaged in the broader world but our classroom discussion is trying to wrap everything up and make sure that we feel confident with our views moving forward that's why we opened up the class with the discussion of what is a religion and we talked about different theories of what religion would be and different definitions and we weighed this out and we analyzed different major theorists and what they would do, and then we brought that back at the very end here. We read Jay-Z Smith and understood the history of the term of religion. And then we kind of teased this out a little bit more when looking at existentialists, both theistic existentialists and atheistic existentialists. We saw about the variety of even one camp of existentialist and yet a unifying idea would we want to call existentialism in total a religion or not how easy is it to apply to the questions that we had right before all of that all of this of course points to our own decisions that we need to make decisions that require action and not just passivity but how should they be directed what roles should we do with that? And of course, this of course focuses us back on questions of virtue and Aristotle to whom we touched on at the beginning and once again here at the end. Do we wanna flourish or is it just happiness? And is there a difference between standard happiness and real flourishing? And of course, then the question goes from whose happiness, if we're going to look at happiness, counts? Is it just mine? Am I an egoist? Or is it about the greatest number? And of course, that brings us to other questions of what do we owe one another? What do I owe my neighbor? What do I owe the person down the street? My broader community, my nation, the world? Do I owe them anything? Or do I just get what I want? And it doesn't really matter. So we're gonna to try to play around a little bit with this idea of relationships and how this impacts things. Is it just duty-bound deontology? Is it about the consequences? Is it the greatest number or is it just me? Or is it about me being virtuous and other people become examples for my virtues and opportunities for my virtues? This whole relationship ethics kind of lays on top of whatever other ethical framework that you see. It gives you an opportunity to challenge what you believe and advance what you believe all the more. Ultimately, we're trying to help you find out which of these theories can help you most in constructing your own personal ethical standard and how this can best work with the previous systems of beliefs and practices that we have addressed in overcoming the passions that oftentimes control your life. When addressing relationship ethics, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. 
One way that I'm particularly fond of is by looking at the lifeboat analogy. It makes you feel critical that we need to make a decision now. And it's something that is easy to kind of picture in many different ways. Garrett and Hardin popularized this in the mid 70s with an article he had about living on a lifeboat. In it, he opens by saying that no generation has viewed the problem of the survival of the human species as seriously as we have. In the 70s and really kind of post-war period, height of the Cold War, there was this whole question of how much longer are we going to make it? Recently, in the last few decades, we've kind of re-energized this same sort of idea, not from a Cold War perspective of, or even an overpopulation, but just about total number of possibilities of global cataclysms that may or may not occur. For those in the 70s, they thought there was a critical problem of overpopulation. And we needed to look at what happens if you oversaturate the earth. What will it do? What will it do for the quality of life for those who are around? And are we just going to run out of space and resources? We may also need to acknowledge some of the debate surrounding lifeboat ethics in general and Garrett Hardin and the whole living on a lifeboat discussion from 1974. Because many of the predictive models that he used were seen as being too much, exaggerating for the case of effect. He was saying that he was rather sincere at the time, and actually the truth of the matter is, is that when the dates came that he was talking about, his numbers were pretty dang close. If anything, they were a little lower and not an exaggeration of where we are. Now, again, not all predictive models are good, so there's certain things that we can obviously take with a grain of salt going forward and how much we should apply arguments from 50 years ago to today. Because there is some variation along these lines that we should obviously take within you know, a grain of salt one way or the other. But there is some success that can be done, and we should tip our hat to you know, what is there, and at least accept that. There's some just basic realities about lifeboats that make it very easy for us to understand. We have to acknowledge that each lifeboat is effectively uh, limited in some measure by its capacity. The land of every nation also likewise would have limited carrying capacity a lot more than a lifeboat, but there's still a basic how much things cost, how much resources you need versus what you can have going forward. We have all been living on capital, a stored amount of resources, coal, petroleum, and eventually moving forward, these resources that we have are all going to be gone. Now, there's been lots of people throughout history saying, okay, in five years, we're out, in two years, we're out, etc. And, and those were all gross exaggerations. But if anything is going to come to an end, at some point, it'll come to an end. If there's a finite number of things, eventually, they're going to run out. Now, it might be long, long time off, and we shouldn't be so hyperbolic that we're worried about it ending tomorrow, but we need to be at least good stewards of the resources that we have, knowing that one day it will be gone. So if we acknowledge that one day the natural resources that we have will be gone, it's really not that different than a lifeboat, where there's only a set amount of resources that everyone is going to have. It's a little bit easier to count in a lifeboat. It's probably in a box, a crate, a bag of some sort. And it's easy to just say we have this many people, we have this many resources for this net many people, but yeah, the same applies here. We just might have a greater number and the math would be harder, but it's not an impossibility to take one step and apply it to the other. So let us apply this here. 
let's say that we're sitting in a lifeboat. There's 50 people in it, and to be generous, let us assume that our boat has the capacity for 10 more people. We can hold 60 people. Pretty good sized lifeboat. The 50 of us who are on the lifeboat see 100 other people, though, swimming in the water outside. Every single one of these 100 people would like to be in the lifeboat. Otherwise, they know they're doomed, they're lost. So, who do we let in? How do we respond to the calls of save me, save me? What is the criteria that we use to let somebody else in the boat? Since the needs of all of them are the same, every single one of the people in the water are going to drown, be lost. Everyone is equally needy in this way. If we take everyone into the boat, it'll sink. The idea of complete justice where everybody is there results in a complete catastrophe. So what are the criteria you use in deciding who's on the lifeboat? Right now, you should pause and write down a list of three, five, ten different criteria you would use. Which ones count? What really matters in making this decision? Again, you have to use your imagination a little bit. And I assume at this point that maybe you actually did pause and maybe you actually did write these things down because these are not just you know, thought experiments that shouldn't be played with. You really should tease this out and know what you would like to do. Is it simply a first come, first serve? This person was closer, they got in. That person was too far off, they're out of luck. Are we going to use some sort of merit? You look like you can swim longest. We're going to wait till 90 people sink and the last 10 survive? Does it make a difference who they are? They're related to somebody on the lifeboat. Do they get in and the other person's left out? This isn't a purely hypothetical issue too. When we look at the world's population as a whole, about 13% of the world's adults want to move, leave their country. Number one place they want to go, according to a Gallup poll, is to the United States. Roughly 150 million people say they would like to move here today if they could. Can we take 150 million new people into the United States? Population about 300 and some odd million. Can we add 50% to our population and absorb that right now? Likely the answer is not easily, not without major cost. Do we want to let all 150 million in? Do we want to give them all health care, job training? Can we afford that? Can you afford that? Are you happy with the congestion on your roads right now to just get to a basic issue? Or do you want to have a little more living space? Now, there's plenty of open land in the United States. We could absorb some of that cost if we absolutely had to. But is that what we want to do? What is the actual carrying capacity and what is the living capacity? Those might not be the same things. How do we want to envision this and who out of the world do we want to let in? This is not an easy situation for anyone to be put into. This is in some ways why we vote and elect representatives to try to make these decisions, but you should at least have a thought about what are the criteria, if any, you want. Is it simply you'd like to come in, come in? Do we have a number set? What is that number? What should it be? What number are you comfortable with? If it's first come, first serve, what do you tell the person right after that number gets reached? Sorry, you're out of luck. Wait until next year. Maybe we'll open up the turnstile again. Maybe we won't. 
And again, what skills are they bringing? How does that matter? As a society, we are rather generous. We have healthcare, education, lots of other things that we're paying for, the basic infrastructure of the, the country. Who's to pay for all of that? And do they get the say in who's coming in? It's easy to say they should pay for it over there, but if they don't want the, to pay for it, why is it that you're deciding more people are coming in? Do you owe something to the person who's paying for it? Or are they just out of luck because you've decided that they are out of luck? Because there's two of you and one of them, and that's the way this country works? Maybe. And if that's the case, what about these 150 million? Do they get a vote? And what if they say you're paying for it? What if they're saying your space is too big? Time to move out, let somebody else in. Are you willing to say somebody else takes your house? How many of you have a spare room in your house? Beyond that, how many of you have a spare couch? Do you open that up to random people on the street to sleep in? You have more, you have a place. What obligations do you owe them? Or do you just say, no, I prefer my space to be managed by me and I've got uh, rules and locks and doors and all of that other things. Well, what if I vote to say that they get to stay at your place? What if your classmates do? What are the criteria and what's a reasonable criteria for anyone to hold into? And does that same apply to a nation? Or is it different when we change the scale? Is a difference of degree a difference in kind? So this is where you also have to use a little bit of your imagination. I want you to think of a small group of people that you might be friends with or connected with acquaintances, probably something less than 30. Imagine yourself on a lifeboat with half of them. You made it. The other half, they're out of luck. These are people you know, maybe classmates that you get to see. You get to decide of that which next small percentage, two or three more people, get on and which don't. You could write up a list and actually envision this. You can think about everyone in this class that you've been engaging in over the discussion boards and and saying, all right, here's you know X amount of seats, fill them up. Who gets in and who doesn't? And why? It would probably be a good idea in the discussion board for you to say some reasons why you think you would deserve a seat on that boat. Because you probably think that you do, right? Now, it's hard to be the person who decides who's in and who's out. But while you might feel guilty about your good luck, you're probably not saying... I'm out, I'll give up my seat. You feel bad about it, you were, didn't do anything to deserve it, but you got it now, so congratulations to you. And if you could only pick five people out of the entire class to join you, which are the five you would pick? Why? Why those and not somebody else? Again, there should be a good amount of time pausing this and pondering. And so the lecture will be a little bit shorter, but the thoughts should be something a little bit more lasting. What are the criteria that you use? And why not some other criteria? What, what makes you worth sparing? And does that same criteria apply to somebody else? Returning once again to Garrett Hardin and the question that he was addressing, the problem and its basic nature isn't that there isn't any space and that we are at capacity now, and isn't even that in nice wealthy areas there isn't some extra capacity. The problem though is how things are going to look going forward. The problem is that the more 
poor countries or the least developed countries are expanding at rates that don't allow them to catch up to the middle class and wealthier countries. This was the argument made by the United Nations in 2005 when they were studying population density itself. They stated that rapid population growth was fueled by high fertility rates presents a barrier to reducing poverty levels and reaching other internationally agreed development goals. And the problem continues that roughly women in these least developed countries have about five children on average. The UN estimates that the world population would be over 9 billion by 2050, although most are going to then revise these numbers of saying that that might be about the peak at world population. In Europe right now, the rates are about 1.6 live births by per woman. Now, doing some basic math, each woman should be having about 2.1 live births to keep the population level. If you're at less than 2.1, your population is decreasing. You might actually need to immigrate more people to keep your economy, which is usually based on a growing population, going. The United States is about 1.7 live births per woman. If the least developed countries are having five and we're having less than two, there seems to be an excess population that's going in the wrong directions. Japan has one of the lowest birth rates in the world, about eight per thousand people, and is quickly evaporating. The people inside the lifeboats are the wealthy nations Garrett Harding was pointing out at his time. were doubling about every 87 years on average, while those outside were doubling every 35. Right now, if we take the birth rates being less than 2.1, we're not doubling anymore. We're shrinking. We are stagnant and contracting if it isn't for the value we get from some immigration. So to go back to other discussions of some of you saying zero people should come in, let's close it all up, which I don't think any of you actually did. If so, we're running into our own set of economic issues going forward. The problem for Garrett Hardin in 1974 was the question of when you double. The model that he gave of non-Americans to Americans start off as one to one, but considering the ratio would be 87 years later, the time Americans would have doubled their population to at that point 420 million, the other group doubling every 21 years would now have 3,540,000,000. Each American now has more than eight people to share with. What happens when, instead of a one-to-one -one obligation, you're now keeping eight people afloat? Now, again, we don't grow. We're now shrinking. Uh, so this isn't an accurate discussion anymore, but... The basic root of it is, if indeed we're shrinking, this disparity in fact grows if it's even anywhere near the same as it was before. This and now becomes an even greater weight upon the surviving Americans to keep the third world afloat. Each individual now has more people that they are responsible for because of the disparity. And while that might open up some more seats on our lifeboat, are they the people that you want coming in? Do we want to take the best and the brightest from the world? That's the criteria that many of you probably would have. But if you're removing them from their country, the best and brightest of that country isn't going to be producing anything in their own land. Is that an ethical decision? We're doubling and we're doing great, but they're now floundering and the few there who could have maybe helped were taking because we needed them for us. Are we back to just being egoists? Is that morally okay? Or is that different when you're talking about a nation then? 
and new sort of scope for utilitarianism possibly. There is a question also being posed by Garrett Hardin pointing out that there is a sort of moral flaw to things like the World Food Bank. That we might want to say that those people over there, wherever they are, are starving and the World Food Bank is helping them. And that seems like a generous and kind thing to do. Except if they're still having children and they're growing and they're producing, what happens when the World Food Bank runs out of food, has a problem, that the wealthy countries have their own issue, a world cataclysm comes and everything gets shut down. The distribution lines are shut off. Ideas that don't seem so crazy in a post-COVID world. What happens at that point? What happens when the generosity of people are hampered by growth of massive inflation for their own basic food goods and the cost of bringing that food somewhere else skyrockets a greater number of people at that point are going to starve and not have enough to survive so feeding people today who are starving only means more starving people in the future what is the solution to this should we have something be a short, temporary time with the World Food Bank? You get a week, you get a month, you get a year. Sorry for this famine, but what's the difference between a famine and just the basic ecology not supporting the population? If you are oversaturating people because they don't have enough in the basic land to produce it, most of the world is not as great at growing food as the United States. There's different areas that have usually been the bread baskets of empires and regions, but if you're outside of that bread basket, you're just out of luck. Sand doesn't grow a lot of food. Snow and rock don't grow a lot of food. What do you do with the people who are there? What do you do with those whose topsoil has been eroded through one means or another? Just basic climatological and ecological realities. You can't teach them to farm any better because the land isn't going to do that. Do we want to migrate them all to the coasts or somewhere else and now oversaturate that land? What if they don't want to go? Are they out of luck? Do you offer them food knowing that there's going to now be five mouths in 20 years? Is that an ethical thing to do? Or is the ethical thing to do to tell them, I'm sorry, you're going to starve now? Are there any middle grounds that can be done? Almost every middle ground anyone has ever talked about in this class kind of feels scary and icky and wrong. We're usually finding ourselves in this weird and awkward place where there is no good solution. So we go back to our other notions of what ethics are. Because remember, the whole point of lifeboat ethics and relationship ethics is to test out your other ethical theories. It's not just an abstraction, but it's moving forward and trying to figure out what the best thing is to do going forward. Do you feed starving people on the other side of the planet? whose population is only going to continue to increase if you feed them. If you don't feed them, they'll die and you could have fed them. Is there a morally right answer to this question? What do we do with the trends that exist? Because certain countries continue to grow like India. China is about to collapse. Japan is dying because they're not replicating. The United States is also slowly shrinking, depending on how things look, uh, if we're including immigration or not. We're running into all sorts of new dilemmas with population growth. And what we're supposed to do with all of that is a major problem that 
again, because you're a part of this world, you should be thinking about at least a little bit. So do you have any solutions to this problem? Is hope a strategy? Because that's usually where a lot of people are left. What do we do going forward? What counts? What's beneficial? Giving them jobs might work. Giving them resources might work. But again, there's just basic, what does the land have to offer? If it's fairly barren and is fine at keeping a certain population alive, but not its current population and definitely not a increased population, what is it that you do? What can you do and what should you do? So which ethical theory works best? Which of the ideas that we've talked about in this class would help you out? Is it about the consequences or do the consequences not matter? Was Kant right? It's about duty. It's about an obligation. I need to help and it doesn't really matter that it's going to lead to greater ruin in the future. Is it about certain virtues that lay in and hold up that you're going to work on what you can and be the best person that you can and hopefully an answer shows up for some of these? Do any of these help you out on a lifeboat? And how would you apply any of the atheistic or theistic systems of beliefs and practices that we've talked about in this class within this sort of situation? Could stoicism help out in any ways? Keep a stiff upper lip? <laughs> or do they help you address only smaller concerns, concerns of your life and not geopolitical issues? And Marcus Aurelius was applying this into, you know, the Roman Empire, but how is that going to work for you? It's been a fun semester. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and it's fun to kind of leave on this point where we don't have a clear answer where you need to really kind of weigh your decisions and, and know that sometimes, as good as our ethical theories are, they might not provide us with all of the answers. Sometimes we're just out of luck and life is just hard and we have to do the best that we can. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out and I will talk at you later. Bye. The lifeboat example is a really great one to revisit some of those criteria that we talked about earlier on in the semester. Are the ideas universal? Are they consistent, both internal and external? And what ideas do we have that are simple, or at least simpler than some of the others? Again, sometimes we have to make ethical choices real quick, and we don't have time to wait forever, so simplicity works. Now that we're talking about ethics of relationship, do we want to add some other criteria into this list of what sort of moral system we're going to want to use and move and operate? Do we want to talk about what works for those that I love? Maybe I'm not an egoist, but maybe I care about more than the world. Maybe I care a little bit more about those people who are closer to my world. Maybe I want to save those who I can save because they're close to me and maybe they're emotionally close or maybe they're just physically close. My neighbor is a lot easier to affect than somebody on the other side of the world. And does that change the relationship and the criteria that we had for evaluating other moral systems? So as we move forward, we'll kind of add a few more ideas and theories to our tool belt. But ethics of relationship oftentimes can complement, not kind of stand on their own, some other ethical theories that we move and operate with. So think these through and see how this is going to move and operate within your own life and those around you.